Hello, everyone. We're just going to wait another 10, 20 seconds before we get started. Good morning. I didn't want to say good morning because I'm in Toronto, outside of Toronto and you could be afternoon. So hi, everyone. Welcome. Do tell us where you're dialing in from. Would you believe our speaker is all the way in Hawaii? I am so <laughs> jealous. <laughs> right. Okay, great. So another maybe a couple of seconds and we'll get started. Mm -hmm. I know we, it, the timing is good. We were just coming out of the welcome the session for Saturday. So people might be a few minutes late. I can see we've got people in Texas. Lucky speaker, ooh. <laughs> Manila, someone's dialing from Manila. Hello, Mar Yeah, that's really cool. And uh, Austin, Texas is in the house. I recognize the name, Shonda. All right. And of course, yay, Toronto, can you? <laughs> welcome, welcome, my sister. Okay. Let's begin, and then of course people will join as we start. Because I don't, I want to make sure we have enough time for Gwen to do her amazing presentation. Well, hello again, and welcome to day two of the awesome collaboration between L and D Cares and Global Learning and Development Community, also known as GLDC. Now you are in the Design Inclusive Training, Go Beyond Accessibility go beyond accessibility to reach all learners session. That's where you are. I'm your host, Rita Secret. And before we begin, I'd like to take care of some housekeeping items. For any technical issues, try refreshing your page by pressing the function key five, that's F5 on your keyboard, or use the purple question mark located at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, and there will be someone live to help you out. On your right panel, there's a couple of tabs. You can see the chat. Most of you have been using it this morning, and that's great. Then you've got the Q&A and the poll. We will be using the poll this morning. And submit, I kindly ask you to submit all your questions in the Q&A tab. Now, throughout the session, I really would like to encourage you to show your support by using the smiley emoticon located towards the bottom middle of your screen. And beside that smiley emoticon is a raised hand, which can be used in the session for Q&A and also closed captioning for anyone needing it. Oh, right, I can see all the flying <laughs> emoticons coming by. Just so you know, the session is being taped for our speaker. Now, let me introduce our speaker and then I will hand it over to her. Our distinguished speaker today is Gwen Navarrete Klapperich. Gwen has more than 20 years experience in training and development, customer service supervision, and quality assurance initiatives. She has worked in various industries, including retail, call centers, healthcare, government, hospitality, not-for-profit, and continuing education. Wow. Gwen earned her CPTD from the Association of Talent Development, which is also ATD, and she holds a master's degree in education specializing in training and performance improvement from Capella University. Please, 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 please show your virtual support and welcome Gwen. Gwen will be talking on design inclusive training, go beyond accessibility to reach all learners. Over to you, Gwen. Thank you, Rita, for that warm introduction. I'm going to share my presentation. Take your time. Mm -hmm. Okay. And again, thank you very much, everybody. My name is Gwen Navarrete Klaprick. And for those of you who are unable to see me, I'm going to provide a very brief verbal description of myself. I am a Filipino female. I am wearing a black dress with a red sweater, and I have short black hair and red glasses. Uh, sorry, so those, the, the slide is kind of small. Would you be able to maximize it on your screens for sure. the audience? I apologize for interrupting you. Sure, not a problem. Is that better? It's still small. Um, well, 
because we can't read this slide. Is any okay? Uh, so um, basically, all you need is the I'll, the rest of the slides will probably be a little bit bigger. Um, but basically, if you need translation or closed captioning, you just need to scan that QR code, and it'll pull up something on your phone called Microsoft Translator, and you can view the presentation in whichever language you wish to. And that's probably why it's so small because the instructions are small. It's a little bit a little bit counterintuitive to accessibility, but <laughs> so my apologies there. Okay. I'm really excited to talk to you about this uh, topic, which is designing inclusive training and going beyond accessibility to reach all learners. And I want to start with a you know, just ask you to picture something really quickly for me. Uh, as you know, Rita mentioned, I was in a continuing education department in a co community college about seven years ago, five or six, five to seven years ago. And I was tasked with redesigning the tour guide certification program. Well, it was my first time actually observing the, the current curriculum. And I noticed that there was a lot of text heavy stuff in there. There was a lot of testing on Hawaiian language, history and culture. And that's because the tour guides needed to be certified at the end of the program. And these were current tour guides who were just coming in because their employer wanted them to get the certification. Well, during the first break, I had a gentleman approach me and he said to me, I'm afraid that I'm not going to be able to pass this class because I can't read. And I don't know what I'm going to do because I can't lose my job. And I was taken aback a little bit because I thought I had prepared everything, every contingency I had thought of for this particular training. Because before that, I had been able to make accommodations for other learners. So for example, in the Philippines, a couple of years before that, I had a woman who also approached me and said, I can't see very well and I don't wanna tell my employer, so what do I do when it comes time for this training class? And for her, what I had been able to do was sit her down in front of the computer and have her drive the PowerPoint presentation so that she could in essence see the presentation without disclosing to her employer that she couldn't see. So I was able to do that, but with this gentleman, I was unable to make an accommodation at that very moment. I had to think about it. And it really got me thinking about accessibility and how we get there and how we can go beyond really that accessibility with just the tech stuff and really find a way to, excuse me, to reach all of our learners. So I'm going to actually, we're going to guard this poll here. So I've got multiple windows up. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start with the poll very really quickly. Gwyneth, before you go forward, there's someone, a few people are asking for the QR code again for the languages. If you could just sure. re, uh, uh, display that. Okay, there we go. And maybe leave it for a couple of seconds. Thank you kindly. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. All right. So we're going to go ahead and launch a poll real quickly. Let me see if I can get this working correctly. When you design training materials for your learners, can you please tell me um, which of the following you consider? Do you consider their different learning abilities? Do you consider their different languages? you consider the literacy level of the participants or their accessibility or none of the above? There's no wrong or right answer. Just wanted to get a gauge of where everybody is right now. Okay, looks like we've got quite a bit of people who have answered. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll. Everybody should see the results. It looks like the majority of you are, are designing for different, for a, it's a wide variety, but it looks like the majority of you are also designing for accessibility and different learning abilities, which is good. Um, sometimes when I do this poll, everybody says accessibility and nothing else. And then the, what I really want to challenge you is to think about um, everything more than tech. We'll start with a little bit of an exercise. I want you to imagine
the day that you started today, and I know it's early in the morning for some of us, but just think about the from the minute you woke up, what you did throughout the day until the time that it was that you actually signed on for this conference. And I want you to think about if something um, were to be different for you. For example, let's say that you were on the autism spectrum, or maybe you had a vision impairment or a hearing impairment, or maybe you had dyslexia, or you use a wheelchair, or you have a motor mobility impairment. I want you to think about the day that you've had so far and think about how different that day would be if this condition or situation applied to you and what barriers you would face, if any. And also too, are there any tools that could, you could use to help you get there? Okay, so go ahead and put it in the chat. What would be different about your day if any of those conditions that I mentioned applied to you? Okay, um, I will read them as they come in. Um, uh, people are probably thinking, uh, the fridge would be too tall if I was in the wheelchair. I'd need to brew my own coffee. <laughs> okay, thank you, Kara. Nice, let's see. That's a good one. That is a good one. What else? Any other challenges that you think you would face? Mm -hmm. uh, if I was visually impaired, I'm sure I can, uh, I'd access air meat. I'm not mm -hmm. sure how I would access this to air meat. Thank mm -hmm. you, Sarah. I was thinking about that as I was accessing the platform. I was like, if I had a hearing impairment or a visual impairment, I don't know yeah. if there's, I don't know if it's accessible. Mm -hmm. oh, I was thinking about that too. Hey, okay. Anything else? And um, would take a lot longer to do everything from Brenda. Thank you, Brenda, for sharing that. So that's very, mm -hmm. very true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing, everybody. You know, um, perhaps these learning challenges are why sometimes our presentations or our training classes aren't understood or comprehended the way we want them to be. And so what I want to do today is I want to introduce a concept called universal design for learning. And we'll talk about the what, how, and why of learning. And I'll talk about the seven principles of universal design for learning as we go through the presentation. Now, universal design for learning is based off of something called universal design. And it basically, universal design is a broad spectrum of ideas that it basically is of buildings, products, environments, something that is basically beneficial to, it's designed mostly for people with disabilities, but it's designed to benefit everybody, not just people with disabilities, but people without disabilities. So let's think of an example. Can you think of something that is pretty much worldwide, especially in big cities, that was originally designed for people who use wheelchairs, but is beneficial to everybody, that everybody uses? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, yes, of course. Sidewalk ramp, ramps, elevators, curb cuts, uh, ramps. Yes, that yeah. seems to be yeah. uh, quite uh, curb. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Elevators, ramps, sidewalk ramps, you know, anything with a slope on it that a wheelchair can access. Now, let's say that, you know, other than people who use a wheelchair, who else uses a sidewalk ramp or a wheelchair ramp or a curb cut? Mm -hmm. Me, me, elderly, that's good. Mo mobility impaired, children injured, people. Yeah, so you can see how something that was designed technically for people with disabilities actually benefits everybody. And that's really a concept of universal design is that it's supposed to benefit everybody. And when you design for people on the quote unquote margins, everybody else in the middle benefits. Let's take a look at another example. Texting. Who here loves texting? <laughs> okay. There was, yeah. 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 Okay. Texting was actually originally designed for people who were hard of hearing or deaf. Now, this is something that everybody in the world practically uses. But again, it wasn't originally designed for us. But you can see how we all benefit from something that was designed for somebody with uh, an impairment. 
Hmm. Now, how many of you have heard, all of us have heard of design thinking, right? What do you think the difference is between universal design and design thinking? Okay. Um, so you can put it in the chat. Design thinking is to solve a single problem from Kira. Thank you. Um, speech to text. Also, design thinking is an approach to meeting particular challenges. Design thinking is making some useful. Mm -hmm. Some of the comments coming in. Okay. Great, thank you. I mean, universal design and design thinking are both user focused. What the difference is is that universal design is more focused on accessibility and design thinking is more focused on innovation. So I will give you a little bit of an example and we'll decide whether it's universal design or design thinking or maybe a little bit of both. How many of you are familiar with this peeler? It's the OXO peeler. Has anybody heard of it? Yeah, Kara has. And, yeah. Okay, great. So basically, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the OXO peeler, it was invented by a gentleman who noticed that his wife, who had arthritis, was having problems peeling vegetables. And so he basically put his design thinking skills to work and came up with a peeler that had a comfort grip and a wider grip on it so that she could grip it a little bit easier, even with her arthritis. And it's actually something that's taken off worldwide. It's very popular. Some of the highest brand names sell them. You know, you can find it anywhere from you know, at William Sonoma or Target or one of the a lot of kitchenware stores actually sell them now. But again, it was designed for somebody who necessarily, you know, wasn't in the quote unquote mainstream, but everybody benefits. So do you think this was universal design or design thinking or a little bit of both? Mm -hmm. Let's see, we've got um, both, both uh, Brenda and Sarah, Kara, both uh, Sarah, they're all, most of them are agree agreeing that it's both, a bit of both. Okay, great. And universal design for learning is based off of universal design. And what I like to equate it to is going to a restaurant and ordering a meal. Actually, I can't take credit for this analogy. Um, a professor who teaches universal design for learning uh, Dr. Katie Novak actually came up with it. And basically when you go to a restaurant, there are always options, right? There are options for your food allergies, for your, your, your taste preferences, for, or if you go pre-COVID, we could go to a buffet, right? And get whatever we wanted. Everybody enjoys an equal meal without feeling any different, noticeable difference from the guests sitting next to them. And we're all enjoying our own meal. Now, most training, not all, but most training is designed as a prefixed menu where you sit down and you have four courses that are set for you. Okay. And sometimes, you know, when you go to those restaurants and say no substitutions allowed or no personalization allowed or no custom orders allowed, it's kind of the way some training is actually designed and developed. What UDL does is it actually helps you designed for a wide variety of learners. So you see here that this is learner diversity. We've got sensory mobility and hidden challenges. And just, just for a little bit of statistics sake, you know that there are 15% of the people in the world population actually have some kind of disability. Now that doesn't sound like much, but that's actually over 1 billion people. And of those people, a lot of it has to do with the aging population. So unfortunately, the older we get, the likelihood that we're going to develop a disability actually increases, whether it's uh, hearing or sense or sight or having to use a walker, those types of things. And they're predicting, the, they're predicting that the population of people age 60 and older is going to double by the year 2050. Right now it's about 12%. They're saying that it's gonna be almost 24% by the year 2050. Unfortunately, I'm gonna be in that population by that year, but you know, we'll leave that conversation for another day. There's also another variety is you know learner diversity when we're talking about low literacy. Now, literacy actually worldwide is actually pretty high. It's about 86% for people ages 15 or older. But that doesn't mean that the reading level is there. I was trying to look up some statistics and 7 million people in the UK actually have low literacy levels 
And they're saying that according to the Forbes magazine, Gallup did a poll and 54% of adults in the United States actually read at a sixth grade level mm -hmm. or below. So that's actually a problem, right? When we're talking about literacy, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to design too high or too low, but we want to be able to see what that sweet spot is. Now, many people with low literacy are also hesitant to use technology for obvious reasons. They're unsure of how to read, so they're unsure of the capabilities of actually using technology. Now, according to the World Economic Forum, do you know 25% of people in this world do not know how to use a computer? And of those who do, only 45% of them are at a basic level. Really, only 30% of the world's population are proficient in computer usage. And this can affect us is, you know, exactly with COVID, we're all finding that, you know, we all had to adapt to technology and we were finding it difficult to do so, especially if everybody wasn't on the same page. And lastly, we have our language and culture learners. Okay. Do you know what the top three languages in the world are? Go ahead and put it in the chat. Okay, let's see. Top three languages. Um... All right, we've got English, Spanish, German. Thank you, Kara. Anyone else? English, Chinese, Spanish, Brenda. English, Chinese, Arabic from Sarah. English, Spanish, Chinese from Shonda. Oh, wait. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Kara, thanks. Um, let's go. Yeah. So the top three languages according to TEFL, which are the people who do um, the English, English as a foreign language training, are English, uh, Mandarin, which is Chinese, and believe it or not, Hindi. Hindi oh. has 600 million people who speak it, whereas Spanish only has about 534 million people who speak it. Mm. Now, the reason why I bring this up is that out of that world population, 1.5 billion of those people are actually English language learners. So while the majority of us will design for English, it's important for us to realize that not everybody has it as their first language. So what are the benefits of UDL? I want to do a little bit of a poll for us before we go into this part. When you are presented, you know, when you read a news story at the top, they usually have the video of the news story and then underneath it, they have the transcript. How many of you would rather watch the video and how many of you would rather read the transcript of the article? Okay, so just put in video or transcript. No, Shonda is right, video, video, Kara, yeah. Dina is video, watch video, Lisa. Yes, yeah, they they're all video, very, very um, what's the transcript, Brenda? Sarah says, depending on why, why I'm watching, and Arini, definitely the video. Video yeah. seems to win. Yeah, there we go. And so it's basically, it's about options, right? So think about maybe for an audio interview. So a lot of us listen to podcasts nowadays. When I was actually studying for my master's degree, I had to listen to a lot of podcasts. But what I found was that it was actually easier for me to download the transcript and actually highlight the words that I needed to remember in order for me to study a little bit better. So that's also an option, right? Something that was actually developed for somebody who was hard of hearing or hearing impaired is something that I benefited from. Let's talk about books. How many of you read, uh, how many of you read a book as, and how many of you listen to an audio book? Okay, so read or listen. Let's see what... Uh, audiobook, audio, both. Uh, uh, Brenda's doing both. Dina is reading uh, audio. Shonda, audio. Sarah, both, but prefer reading. Sarah, we read the book. Kara, audio. Brenda, read. Lisa, audio. I have a long commute to work. <laughs> <laughs> we know about that. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. Thank you for that. You know, and again, audiobooks were originally designed for people who uh, had vision impairment. But all of us actually benefit from that if we choose to listen to an audiobook, correct? Mm -hmm. So what that means is that the benefits to learners when we use universal design for learning is that they have greater access to presentation content. And this leads to greater opportunities for achievement, which leads to greater satisfaction with the learning process. Now, benefits to us as trainers is this. If we design with universal design for learning in mind at the very beginning of our process, as opposed to afterwards, and we don't treat it as an afterthought, we don't need to make accommodations in the future. And UDL actually gives us tools to consider how and what to present in a systemic and structured manner. Now, did anybody notice that I just did a training boo-boo? 
Does anybody know what I just did? Uh, let's see. Um, you read what was on the screen. Yeah, put what you were seeing over the picture. What um, is it in the text or in the picture? Hmm. These are what comments are coming in. So I'm not sure if it's relating, if it's re relating to your question. Yeah. So, do you want to share your boo boo? <laughs> sure, sure. So I read from the screen, and yes, I see that the text is over the picture. Sometimes we do that as well, yeah. Um, but I read from the screen, and uh, that's like the number one thing that we're all told when we have give our presentations, right? Is do not read from the screen. Why? Why do we not want to read from the screen? Let's because see. I will check the chat and see what. Um, okay, so. Uh, let's see, cog overload, mayor's multiple principles, insult the intelligence of people because of redundancy principles, people will remember less. Ooh, some really good ones. Mm -hmm. I, I was always, I always use what Shonda writes when, when I'm with adult learners, I always yeah. say insult the intelligence of your audience. Um, cognitive overload, I agree with Dina. Kara is agreeing with Dina. Your brain is processing the same in for using two channels, which makes the learner work harder. That's from Sarah. Also, I think with the audio, the, the learner might shut down with the screen and listen to the voice more mm -hmm. first. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. So, so. so I'm going to challenge that a little bit because what, you know, what I've been told and what, the, what the people usually answer for me is, well, they can read what's on the screen for themselves. And I want you to ask yourself, can they really? What happens if it's a gentleman like the gentleman I talked about at the very beginning of my presentation, who's hiding the fact that he's got a learning disability? Mm. Um, I did this exercise with uh, you know, some of my husband's coworkers and one of them said, yeah, I have dyslexia. I can't read whatever's on a PowerPoint. Mm. I had another learner tell me, I can't read what's on a PowerPoint because especially um, everything seems to be washed out for me because I have cataracts. So if they have some kind of vision impairment or reading impairment, find a way to actually weave the text into your presentation so that they know what's on the slide. Um, but try to avoid saying, you can just read what's on the slide because sometimes people can't. So I'm just going to, to kind of put that challenge out there. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me move on here. I just have a comment from Dina. She works with students who have learning disabilities, processing speed and working memory. They need that info. Maybe you can, that's kind of what you were just alluding to in your comments. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and it's uh, sometimes, yes, it can be cognitive overload, but I think that's why when I, when I talk about the three elements of UDL, I'm gonna talk about a lot about options. Mm -hmm. And really it's about our choices. So we talked about you know, our choices between whether we wanted to watch the video or whether we wanted to read the transcript or whether we wanted to listen to the audio or we wanted to read the transcript. And so it's about those choices for learners so that they actually have the learning experience that's optimized for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So universal design for learning is a framework that incorporates a whole bunch of different instructional models, methods, assessments. And again, the idea here is that if we design for people on the quote unquote margins, everybody else in the middle benefits. And there are seven principles of universal design for learning. The first is that it's equitable use. So this provides the same means of use for all learners and diverse abilities and design is appealing to everyone. And it also means flexibility in use. So it's designed to actually accommodate a wide range of learning preferences and learning abilities. And that's kind of what we were talking about with the whole, you know, do you, how, do you, want, to, do you want to use the video or do you want to use the transcript? It should be simple and intuitive, meaning it should be simple enough to understand and use regardless of the user's experiences, their knowledge and their abilities, their language skills, et cetera. And the difference between simple and intuitive use and perceptible information is that perceptible information is communicating what's necessary effectively regardless of the environment and the surrounding conditions. When you're talking about universal design for learning, you really need to have a high tolerance for error. So obviously, if you're an airline pilot, this does not apply. But 
really giving people that chance to make that mistake and to say it's okay and to limit consequences from making mistakes. Now, the last two have more to do with an in-person classroom environment or even sometimes a virtual environment than it would be for e-learning, but low physical effort, meaning that it should be efficient and comfortable while minimizing the need for, so it minimizes fatigue. So, you know, we we're all talking about Zoom fatigue and reading computer screens and a little bit earlier, somebody said that the, print, the, the text was small. So, you know, it's, it's trying to limit that low, that physical effort to be able to learn. And then you also want to talk about size and space for approach and use. And what this means is that the design actually uh, basically uses the space appropriately, regardless of the person's body size, posture, or mobility. So again, that's more for in-person classroom. Now, there are three elements of universal design for learning. And again, what I want to emphasize here is the word options. You don't have to do everything, but it would help if you did some of these things. Now, the first element of universal design for learning is something that we call multiple means of engagement. And this is the why of learning. This is the part of the brain that keeps us challenged and engaged and interested. It creates purpose and it uh, uses that part of the, the brain that um, really keeps us interested. So these are different ways to actually maintain engagement with your learners. So promoting expectations and giving options and fostering collaboration and community is really important with this. But you want to and you want to basically find ways to engage their interest and maintain their motivation and provide that continuous challenge. And what I like to say it's more along the lines of we all know we know for those of us who speak English fluently we've all heard the term within, right? So what's in it for me? And that basically is telling us our, our learners of when we're it's, it follows the adult learning principle that most adults want to know what's in it for them or why they should be learning something and why they should be sitting in a classroom. So I'll give you an example. I actually train CPR and first aid classes as part of my business. And while most people are tell you that they're motivated to take it for work purposes, I cannot tell you the amount of people who come to me and tell me that the reason why they are taking this class is because they lost a loved one due to cardiac arrest or a traumatic injury, and they don't want anybody else to have to go through that. I myself, actually, that's my story. That's the reason why I learned these skills. And so it's finding what's in it for that person and finding what really motivates that person to be there that engages that part of the brain. Mm -hmm. We also have multiple means of representation, which is the what of learning. And this is the part of the brain that starts to recognize patterns. This is what recognizes symbols and numbers and categorizes what we see, hear, and read. And basically with this, we wanna clarify vocabulary and symbols, and we wanna promote understanding across languages, and we'll use multiple means of presentation. So for example, in a particular training class, in order for you to be interactive, what are some of the things that you use to actually engage your students and, or your learners, I should say, and what are the multiple ways that you actually present information? So what are some of the ways that you present information in a typical training class? Okay, so let's see. Um, if you can, in the chat, maybe share some of your uh, ideas you've used. Poll questions with responses in chat, game at the end, video slide. We have videos to break down the information, written, audio, icebreaker, storytelling. That's mm -hmm. yeah. collab with neighbor, collaboration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are all ways that you can present information so that it's a little bit varied and that it will actually reach people in different ways. So going back to the first aid CPR classes that I trained, the Red Cross actually does a really good job of this. They use multiple means of representation to train the, the single topic. And yes, they do use repetition a little bit, but it usually comes in three, so it sticks. Usually they do a facilitated discussion, then they'll do a video that actually shows the actual skill, that, and then they, we do hands-on practice. So again, multiple ways of actually reaching people through the way that they learn. And the last element of universal design for learning is something called multiple means of action and expression, and this is the how of learning. 
And this basically involves the strategic network of our brain that indicates how we plan and perform tasks and organize our thoughts. And really it's the strategy and goals for how we use it for ourselves as learners. So this is basically how we in, as individuals learn. Now this actually, I will say, is where trainers can make the most impact as far as reaching all learners or in your design. What this means is that it's actually telling students that they have an option or telling your learners that they have an option of telling you how they have learned what you have trained them. For example, it's a way of checking for understanding. I will give you a story that my son is on the autism spectrum and he was actually in class in a community college and he had to write a paper on mangrove trees, five page paper on mangrove trees. I don't know how he did it, but he was complaining to me and he said, you know, I don't understand why I can't just bring in a mangrove tree and show my professor what I learned. I didn't have an answer for him because would that have actually achieved the objective that the teacher had in getting her students to understand what a mangrove tree was or what the features were? Yeah. So for us as trainers, it's basically giving them the option to tell us how and what they have learned from us. For example, you can, uh, you know, for example, I do this really successfully in a supervisor class that I train. I give them an exercise where I will give them, you know, different resources on how to manage your peers, your former peers. And then basically when they, they train the rest, then they'll, they'll come back and they'll train the rest of the class on what they've learned. And I give them the option of how they want to present that information. Do they want to do a PowerPoint? Do they want to do a sketch? Do they want to, you know, draw a poster? Or do they want to do some infographics? However, the way that they, they want to express themselves in what they've learned is however I choose to let them do that. And I think as trainers, that's how we can really make the biggest impact is because we're checking now for understanding and comprehension. I want to ask a question posed sure. by Kara. It's a comment question. Kara was saying, well, was the learning objective about the mango tree itself or was it really about researching and writing? And it's a valid point, right? So maybe you can yeah. comment on it. If, thank you. So, yeah, thank you for that question. The the I think the exercise itself was to, um, you know, it was a community, it was a freshman level course. So the objective really, it was a biology class. So really the objective was to learn about mangrove trees and to display what they needed in order to understand and to meet the objectives of the class, which was to understand what a mangrove tree was and what the features are and how you could tell what a mangrove tree looked like, et cetera. Um, the research and writing was a secondary tool to basically get them to learn how to write academic, academically. Um, but it was the secondary objective and not the first objective. So that's actually a good question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I Thank hope that you. answers your question. So I realize that a lot of these examples that I'm talking about are in-person class training or sometimes and how do we do this in a virtual world? It's really the same principles. You know, we just have to provide options. So for example, multiple means of representation means accessibility or it means giving options on whether, you know, we're going to, how would you, how would you prevent, present multiple means of media in a virtual world like this. So what are some of the examples that you gave earlier? You gave earlier something like, you know, group work via breakout rooms or polls. Those are things that you can use for multiple means of representation. That also works for multiple means of engagement, meaning to keep their interest. And then for multiple means of action and expression, it's again, giving them options to tell you how they have learned what they have learned. Yeah. Okay. Now, before we move on, I want to um, pause and see if there are any comments or questions. Okay, let's see. So feel free to ask questions or comments or just uh, have a dialogue with Gwen. That's absolutely welcomed as well. Um, yeah. So when you think of universal design for learning and the description that I just gave you, what comes to mind for you? Okay. For the classroom or the virtual, where would you like? Either way, 
Either okay. way. Either way, if uh, it's open for, and let's see. Um, so universal design, what comes to mind for you, whether you're in the classroom or whether you're virtually training? Okay, bunch of questions. Video for, re I find it interesting that UDL is used in learning and development since I learned it as a special ed K-12 teacher. Mm -hmm. I love it. Mm -hmm. Freedom to represent knowledge, learning, providing options. Is there a resource that we could consult that would help us with utilizing UDL in our future training development? Yeah, actually, I will actually put that in the chat as well. It's an organization called CAST. And thank you, Michelle, for um, your story. Yes, UDL is actually mostly used in K through 12 and higher education, but there are a select, uh, a few, a few higher education classes that deal with training and development that are actually starting to use UDL. That's how I stumbled upon it um, and found that, you know, there's also uh, some articles in Training Industry Magazine on it and things like that. But the organization that came up with the principles of universal design for learning is called the Center for Applied Science and Technology. And I've actually put the, uh, the website in the chat for you. Okay, thank um, you. And they actually will have a lot of resources that you can use as well to help you with this. Thank you. And also too, if you want, I will have my email address at the end. You can also email me and I will send you some resources. And connect with you on LinkedIn is an option as well. Yes, connect with me on LinkedIn, that's an option as well. And I'll be happy to send you those resources. Thank you. Okay. So let's talk about applying UDL to training. And I'm going to talk a little bit more in terms of accessibility now. But um, again, it's not necessarily e-learning. It's mostly oh, how do you do this in a virtual environment or how do you do this in a, tra in a training classroom. But let's talk about how you could apply UDL to your actual training classes. So we have a picture here of an eye. I need to describe what's on the slide for those people who are vision impaired. So. Well, some of the things that we could do to actually increase accessibility for those with vision problems, especially if one as we're going back into the classroom, I know we're all probably going to do some blended learning or some hybrid learning. Uh, as we go back into the classroom, it's really important to allow people to have optimized seating, meaning letting people choose where they want to sit so that they can see the screen or they can see the present the presenter or they can see the front of the classroom. Same thing with virtual environments. You want to give them that optimized seating per se so that they can actually see what's on the screen itself. I would suggest using large text and images with high contrast colors. So they're saying about, I forgot what the exact number is, but there's a good portion of the population that's red, green, colorblind. And so they won't be able to actually see the difference between red and greens and yellows and things like that. So addition with that is you wanna use text or symbols to actually differentiate things. So rather than just using, say for example, a stoplight, you know, with red, yellow, and green circles. Maybe you want to use an X for red and a check mark for green. So also using those different those different um, kind of symbols to kind of distinguish what it is that that the color represents would be helpful. And one of the things that I usually recommend for people who you know to tell you, to see whether or not somebody who's colorblind or whether the color will actually come out well is if you print it in, in black and white and then you throw it on the ground and you look at it from a standing height, if you can read it from that height and you can see the you can see the different you know shades of gray from that height all okay, then you're okay as far as high contrast colors are concerned. I would also use sans serif font. Sans serif meaning it's without the little squigglies above and below. It's very linear and very straight. And I would use at a 24 to 28 point font. Now, when I'm in a classroom, what I usually like to do is I like to go to the back of the classroom and see my slide and see if I can read it from the back of the classroom because the size of the room also depends, also de you know, determines how big my, my font size is going to be. And you also want to use proper lighting uh, and you want to describe the slides and the images that are on there for anybody who may be vision impaired. For hearing, so we have an ear on this screen. Again, optimized seating is good. Um, it actually allows people to, you know, maybe position themselves where they can see an ASL interpreter. This also goes for Zoom or for any other type of uh, video conferencing. If they can quote unquote pin the ASL interpreter so that they can see that person, it would actually um, help them. Uh, 
you want to use a lot of visuals. And when you're actually training either virtually or in a classroom, it's really important that we face the front of the audience or face the camera. And the reason for that is that some people actually who are hearing impaired are able to read lips. Mm -hmm. And if we turn around and we face the, the, the whiteboard or we look down at our notes, they may not be able to read their lips as clearly. I would, again, try to use appropriate volume. Close captioning and transcripts are always an option. Try to use proper acoustics when you're in a live environment so that the echo doesn't come off. You know, you've ever been in those presentations where the microphone echoes and you can't understand the speaker because the acoustics are so bad. It's kind of the same principle. And then in a virtual environment, you also want to use, make sure that your microphone and your speakers are able to be seen and heard. So testing that out. Now, access for mobility is interesting because there's different ways um, and there's different, there's so many different mobility issues out there, but I will give you some basic tips. Again, we're talking about optimized seating and that basically means are your seats um, accessible to people with wheelchairs? Is it low enough? Um, is the classroom easy to navigate? Are there any obstructions between the door and where this person is, needs to sit? And accommodations are actually unique to each individual. And I will say that people with hearing uh, or vision impairment or mobility impairment will actually usually tell you what accommodations they need if they choose to disclose that to their employer. Most people will not, okay? But if they choose to disclose it to their employer, they will tell you what accommodations they need. But I would ask them, rather don't assume, I would ask them what is it that you need in order to be able to effectively learn in this class? For my virtual classes, what I usually do is I send out an announcement a couple of weeks ahead of time to say, if you need any special accommodations, such as an ASL interpreter or closed captioning, please let me know by this date and I will do what I can to accommodate you. Now, our hidden learner challenges, this would be people who have chronic illness, maybe have mental illness, maybe they have dyslexia or dyscalculia. Dyscalculia is the math form of dyslexia, so they can't see numbers, they see them all backwards. You want to use simplified instructions so that they're able to read it. And again, have it be easy to navigate and easy to understand. And what I mean by predictable is that, again, the what of learning is pattern recognition, correct? So how do you set up something so that the answer might be predictable or they can see the direction that you are going in so that they are able to better predict what it is that you are going to say or what the outcome is going to be? And the reason why I also toot sans serif fonts, for example, this is like Arial or Calibre or Garamond. The reason why I advocate for using this in all presentations and in all texts really is because people with dyslexia have a hard time reading anything that is um, with a serif, meaning the little squiggly line below or above in some of the in some of the fonts. So using something that's not script, but using something that's plain text is actually easier for people with those learning disabilities to read. Again, you want to use multiple presentation formats. So using the multiple means of media that are available to you. And I would suggest recording training. So I, this training is being recorded for me so I can see how I can be better at it. But it also will help learners who maybe, you know, have maybe miss a part of it or they want to revisit a part of the training. And nowadays with Zoom, we all hear the same thing. Are we going to record this? Can we have the recording? Can we have the slide deck? So it's all, um, you'll see how it all kind of ties together. Now with low literacy, it's almost the same thing. Um, I would suggest trying to write your training materials at a fifth grade reading level. Um, mm -hmm. That actually has simplified instructions to it. It's easier to understand. You want to use visuals. Okay, so again, there's the, and describe the visuals. So there's the book here. Uh, using peer language and familiar words will really help somebody with low literacy. So for example, using the local language or the local terminology or the, you know, that they, and really being able to explain jargon and complex vocabulary is really key. But using familiar words that are um, comforting to them are actually will encourage them to pick up the learning a little bit faster. And you want to make it as interactive as possible, which is what we're doing already as far as training is concerned. A lot of us do train interactively. 
And we want to limit the content material. So try not to overload them. And a lot of us do this already with chunking of material, correct? And we want to give concrete examples as opposed to abstract concepts. So that's why sometimes I try to tell you a story that actually matches the concept that I'm trying to portray. And again, recording training would help. Okay. Now, with digital literacy, it's a little bit harder. So you can see there's a computer screen here on the slide. Unfortunately, with some people who absolutely do not know how to use computers at all or do not know how to use technology, you might have to print hard copies of your material or send it to them in a PDF if they're at least able to uh, download an email. Believe it or not, I read a study that blended learning actually helps people improve their digital literacy because they come into a classroom and they're actually using the computer and they're using the same program and then they or, or they're learning how to use the program. So when they go back and they practice or when they use the, the online portion of their learning, they're actually able to navigate it a little bit better. And that's also too why it's important when you are training to give a little bit of a tutorial on how to actually access. So for example, you know, before this whole conference, we all had a couple of videos on how to use AirMeet and just to be oriented to the technology, especially if it's new for us. So simple instructions and providing how-to job aids will help people with low digital literacy. And lastly, we're going to talk about our, our language learners. So again, using images. So again, describing the images. So we see the globe here on the screen. You want to use the appropriate reading level and try to provide as many hands-on experiences as possible. And also to real world application, and this actually applies to pretty much all learners, especially adults, right? If we can apply what they're learning to the real world, the more likely it is that they will absorb and they will take and they will use that content. And recording the training. Now I will give an example of how I was able to do this. My husband is a safety trainer and he had to actually train uh, on a farm how to use a certain piece of equipment um, safely. And most of the people who worked on this farm spoke Ilocano and Tagalog, which are two Filipino languages, and they could not speak English very well. What he was able to do was he was actually able to record him training a couple of handful of people who spoke English and the language, and they were actually able to train them in that language and demonstrating how to use the equipment. And that's actually how they ended up training the general population. So those are also options that you can use at your dis when you have those tools at your disposal to design for uh, all learn uh, the majority of learners out there. And that is pretty much the accessibility and, and then also to their translator app. So for example, I gave uh, Microsoft Translator. There's also Google Translate. Um, there's a lot of translator apps that are out there right now that you can use. There's also some you know, vision apps and hearing apps. So those are all tools that you can use in your learning as well. Mm -hmm. OK, we're coming up on our time. So what I'd like to do is uh, I would like to open it up for questions and I'd also like you to tell me what is one thing you've learned from today's session or what is one thing that you will do differently when designing training materials and presentations. All right. So I invite everyone, if you can, just please enter your comments, your responses in the chat for us. <clears throat> I actually, the word you use while you're typing, dicalcula? Di Discalcula. Discalcula. I learned that today. I didn't know that. Discalcula. So I'm going to impress my, my, <laughs> my folks around me here this coming and then throw that one out. Shonda said, printing in black and white, drop to the floor and see if I can read it. Very good. Thank you, Shonda. Thank you. Uh, anyone else want to share what their takeaway is? And Yi Val, thank you. Val says using blended learning for non tech savvy folks. Blended, yes. And anyone else? We'll maybe see if one more puts that in. Uh, Michelle says, I am transitioning from K 12 teacher to instructional designer. I am so glad to hear that UDL is used for adult learning. And Sarah has says, shares that there are so many UDL principles to consider that I should develop a checklist right on. Brenda, remember to include options. Shonda, speak slowly for those that are audio learning. 
Michelle says, Cast is an awesome resource. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to, I have a question if I may ask you, um, Gwen. Sure. And I don't know if this is the same thing because I know in Canada, when we design learning and those Canadians that are in the audience today, we use the AODA standard, which is something localized to mm -hmm. here and for people with disabilities. How does that differ from the UDL or is that like a sect or a branch of UDL? Can you maybe just, because I'm sure other countries have something similar. So this is a standard that you use for disability for access purposes or? No, it's for designing training. You know, we would use the closed captioning, the audio, the, the visual things, just basically a lot of the stuff you talked about because mm -hmm. I implement those in features. So I was just curious, like, is maybe they took that from UDL? It's possible, it's possible. And UDL actually goes beyond accessibility in a way. So a lot of the things that I, usually when I learn about accessibility, it's always e-learning or, you know, what's going on technology wise, you know, then usually when people think of accessibility, they're thinking of, they're limiting it to vision impairment, hearing impairment and reading and, you know, text and all those things as far as that's concerned. What UDL does is it goes beyond accessibility a little bit mm -hmm. and asks you to think about how people actually learn and what actually is in their brain. Mm -hmm. and how they uh, strategically apply what they're learning. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the that's the main difference. I can, I'm can i not familiar with the, the mm -hmm. uh, system that you're talking about in Canada. I'd have to look that up. But the, to me, that I would I would assume that that's actually, um, yeah. I would say that that's probably one of the differences. That's, no, I think you're right, because you went deeper. You went into the, the mind or the, the cognitive side of things. Like we just do maybe, uh, but that was very good. So if there are no other questions i'll just give it another second or two if anyone else wants to share any final thoughts and i'm going to give it uh, so let me turn it back to gwen perhaps you can leave us with your final thoughts and then i will wrap up the session gwen sure thank you and really my whole point of this is, again, we only scratch the tip of the iceberg. UDL is very vast. And I know somebody mentioned the checklist. There actually are checklists out there that can help you when you're designing learning for, uh, according to UDL principles. And again, I can share those resources for you. Um, here is my contact information if you like. But I want you to just think about it in terms of, of what you will do and how who you who you're again it's all about who your audience is right and a lot of times people do not disclose that they have a learning disability or that they have a disability to their employer so we can't assume that everybody's going to understand what we do and just think about the gentleman that i talked about earlier in in the morning the one who couldn't read and how would you actually design for him or for somebody who doesn't disclose what their difficulty is in learning mm -hmm. so that's my final thought that's amazing. I do personally, I know on behalf of the audience, they're going to express their uh, virtual thanks. But let me just thank you officially on behalf of the audience. I really like the presentation and the structure. It's taken from a logical approach with the principles to the means of engagement. And, you know, we talk about the the three, the how, the why, the what and the how. And then you gave us some really solid examples. Thank you so much. I know this is not easy to put together in our presentation and to keep everyone engaged and active. And you definitely did that for us this morning. Gwen, I wish I was with you in Hawaii. I would go <laughs> for my, a, a, like a nice fruity drink. Or, you know, with a little... Yeah, all, everybody come visit. Come visit once, yeah. once the travel restrictions are lifting in July. So yeah. come visit. <laughs> and please, if you have any questions, uh, Gwen is very open. Email, LinkedIn reach out to her again on behalf of our audience this morning. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you. All right.